W P H A T. You're listening to the number one health and wellness podcast, the place where health and consciousness connect. Perfectly, Perfectly healthy, healthy and tone, tone radio, radio, radio with your host Darren McDuffie. And now, prepare to get fat. What's cracking, peeps? Darren McDuffie here, alias Fat Man, because I help you become perfectly healthy and toned and conscious. And you're listening to episode 171, Solutions for Lactic Acidosis with Dr. Darren Smith. So what is lactic acidosis and why should you pay attention to it? We cover a lot of material on this podcast specifically. Again, what is lactic acidosis? We talk about keto. We talk about carnivore eating. We talk about nutrition in general. I can't help but like Dr. Darren Smith, not because of his information, but because his name is spelled exactly like mine, D-A-R-R-E-N. But I'm going to go back and say I can like him for his information because he drops a lot of knowledge on this podcast about things that people want to know, particularly keto and like I said, carnivore eating and all the latest trends when it comes to nutrition. So this is going to be an exciting podcast. But before we get into Dr. Darren Smith's bio, I wanted to give you a reminder of the previous episode I did with Tim Steele entitled The Diet Hack. If you are someone out there who is looking to lose weight and keep it off, I suggest you go back and listen to episode 170 because we cover the A to Z to weight loss and particularly why people gain weight and why some people cannot keep it out. Very good podcast. We discuss a lot of stuff. So again, go back and listen to episode 170 with Tim Steele. And you may remember Tim from the potato hack where he used nothing but potatoes to lose weight. And now he's back with a new book, The Diet Hack. So go back and listen to that podcast for episode 170. Now, let's get into Dr. Darren Smith's bio. Dr. Darren Smith is a chiropractor who has been focusing 100% on clinical nutrition since 1998. He owns the Nutritional Healing Center of Ann Arbor and is also a professional speaker on health. Dr. Smith grew up working on his family's farm beginning at the age of nine. He graduated from chiropractic school and started practicing in 1997. His purpose in life is to bankrupt drug companies by helping lots of people become healthy. While in chiropractic college, Dr. Smith attended nearly 50 seminars in 24 months, searching for the most effective therapies to get a person well. He gives lectures and workshops to private church, school, and business groups, and also to the general public. Coming up on episode number 171 with Dr. Darren Smith, Solutions for Lactic Acidosis. Here's what you're going to learn. Why do today's chiropractors focus on nutrition? Now, I've interviewed chiropractors. I've also interviewed doctors, and there seems to be a focus more on nutrition these days. I can't say that for all chiropractors and doctors, but I can say it for the ones that are helping and healing others that there is a focus on nutrition. But why is that? We get into that on this episode. How do chiropractors or how did chiropractors know more about keto than the general public? So in this episode, I learned something and I hope that you will learn something as well about the ketogenic diet. I didn't know that chiropractors knew about this diet way before the general public. And Dr. Darren Smith discusses that on this episode. So pay close attention. What effect does food have on our mood? You'll be astounded to know that food greatly affects how you feel. And we discussed that in episode 171. Why are meatless Mondays a bad idea? I remember I was on a meatless Monday kick a few years ago and I kind of got off of that and I'm glad that I did. Those of you who are vegan or vegetarian out there, I have nothing against you, but I know for myself, I had to get off the meatless Monday kick and Dr. Darren Smith gives a great explanation of why he kicked the habit as well. What is lactic acidosis? That's the title of this whole episode, but if you're like me, I knew nothing about this condition, but Dr. Smith again gives us a great explanation of lactic acidosis on episode 171. How do you kill people nutritionally? I know that sounds harsh. The word kill is a harsh word, but we discuss that on this episode 171 and get into what is being done specifically to kill the general public nutritionally. Episode 171 
It's ready to go right now. Dr. Smith, welcome to Perfectly Healthy and Tone Radio. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for asking. How are you doing? Thanks for being on the show tonight. You're the first person that I've actually had to call Darren because you're Darren and I'm Darren. Right. And our names yeah. exact, spell exactly the same same way. Usually I meet people, their names are not spelled exactly the same as mine, but you happen to have your name spelled, spelled exactly like mine is spelled. But my obligatory question to everyone here that comes on Perfectly Healthy and Tone Radio is, how did you start your health journey? I was pre-med in uh, college, and then when it was time for me to take the MCAT and apply for medical school, I decided to survey doctors and students of medicine to think to see what they thought about their profession. And I'd never really been to a medical doctor except for I had a couple of broken bones. And even to this day, my family's pretty healthy. So we're talking, you know, 1992, 93, and I interviewed 12 people, and none of them encouraged me to go into medicine. It was 0 for 12. So I looked at optometry, podiatry, veterinary medicine, and then I spent a couple hours with a chiropractor. And he showed me the holistic viewpoint that you can have pain in your leg, but the problem's actually in your back. And I actually was, I, I got that because I was, grew up on a farm. And you know, you got to un understand nature, you got to work with nature, and you got to find the cause of any problems to fix the cause. So after that visit with the chiropractor, I decided to be, go to chiropractic school and once I was in the school, I had never been adjusted yet. So I got my first adjustment as a chiropractor in school. But then two years later, I went to a seminar on nutrition given by a guy named Dr. Joel Wallach. And his tagline at the time was, dead doctors don't lie. He still travels now. He's like yeah. over 80 years old. I have Very Dr. Active. Wallach on the show. <laughs> he's oh, been cool. on. Yeah. yeah, so he's the guy that I saw him give this lecture. And I was like, this is why America is so sick. It's our food supply is so bad. So he's the one that turned me on to nutrition. I decided to be a chiropractor who focuses on nutrition. So I graduated in 97, did chiropractic for a year, started adding nutrition in 98. So now here it is 21 years later of hardcore holistic nutrition. Now, personally, I never was, was really sick except for certain exposures. I had black mold poisoning three years ago. Mm -hmm. I thought I was going to die. I've had, with my supplements, I've cleaned my body out of toxins and parasites and Probably the biggest threat to my existence is sun. I've had sunburns a year of my life. I actually have a little brown spot underneath my left eye on my lower eyelid. And the dermatopathologist at University of Michigan about, about two and a half months ago said, oh, it looks like melanoma. Let's do a biopsy. And I refused the biopsy. And melanoma is the worst kind of skin cancer you can get. But I couldn't believe that that would, that, that would be it. Um, anyways, so then I saw her again, and she said that it was smaller and flatter. And then I saw her last week, and then she said it's less brown. So I'm actually making this spot go away. So I And I have several different, you know, various stories like that where I had a health condition, and I fixed it using nutritional supplements and getting to the cause and rearranging my environment. So that, there's my story. Yeah, yeah, good story. You said that you went into nutrition as a chiropractor, and I'm noticing that that's a, a quite a, a trend right now. Why do you think that that's happening? The chiropractors are going into nutrition? Yeah, because usually with chiropractors, the one thing that I've always remembered about chiropractors when I was young, I go to a chiropractor regularly now, but the one thing that I would always hear about chiropractors was, oh, these guys are quacks, and they're only good after you have a car accident, but I'm seeing a lot of chiropractors that are going into nutrition right now, and they're having a lot of success. Why do you think that's happening? So chiropractors get into nutrition through um, the tradition of chiropractic. Like back in the early 1900s, there was that debate between what's called hygienists and the rest of medicine. So we're talking 1900, 1905. People were debating about showers and using soap. Mm -hmm. And um, the chiropractors were like, yeah, we got to have hygiene. And the, you know, you know, conventional doctors at the time were like, no, that's not necessary. So just that holistic viewpoint of having a clean body and eating good food has been ingrained in chiropractors since day one. And then there's supplement companies that cater to chiropractors. One of them is Standard Process, another one is called Biotics. And there's, a, there's many more systemic formulas. And so their audience or their marketplace, if you will, is chiropractic. And then there's a ton of chiropractors that maintaining that holistic viewpoint, they look at diet. 
So diet and supplements, those are my two main tools to help my patients with. Do you find that it's hard because of just what I said, that whole belief? Because I, when I was a kid, I would always hear that, that, oh, you know, chiropractors are no good or chiropractors are just really good after car accidents. So do you have that type of patient that's coming through the doors and really not wanting to listen to you when it comes to nutrition? Or are they coming through the doors and saying, hey, you know what? Dr. Smith, I've tried everything and you were kind of my last resort. Yeah, I don't get patients coming in on a regular basis that don't agree with me because I have my YouTube channel. And so people are watching that those videos that I make. They know what they're getting into. I don't deal with any insurance. I haven't taken insurance since 05. And um, whereas, you know, if, if somebody goes to a doctor for their free health care because they have insurance, they're not, they're not really invested in actually getting well. And, and they don't really, you know, as a general rule, they're not really exploring and educating themselves on the holistic and natural ways to get better. So now I do have people coming in and, uh, for some reason they decide not to do the program because of expense or because their spouse doesn't agree or something like that. But that's actually rare too. So people that come in, they're, they're ready to get going. So. Let's get into this because I wanted to, I have a ton of questions for you because I watched a lot of your YouTube videos. You don't have a book, but looking at, and, and what I normally do is interview people regarding books, but looking at your channel, you had a lot of interesting videos on there. And I remember on one of your, your videos, you talked a little bit about ketogenic. The ketogenic is probably all the rage right now. Everybody's talking about ketogenic. People are talking about carnivore. We'll get into that a little bit later. But on one of your videos, you simply you, you said that chiropractors always knew about ketogenic. Explain that statement and, and, and why you said that. Well, in my career, chiropractors have always been into the ketogenic diet. So I started going to nutrition seminars put on by chiropractors in, you know, 1999, 2000, 2001. Uh -huh. There was one guy in particular named Dr. Michael Dobbins. And he was in ketosis every day for 20 years. He went from 320 pounds to just below 200 pounds. So he lost all that weight. He actually got prostate cancer from working on nuclear submarines for the Navy. He was exposed to too much radiation. And the ketogenic diet prevented his prostate cancer from metastasizing throughout his body because there's a lab test called the Benson test, I'm pretty sure. And if the score is zero, it means that the prostate cancer is only in the prostate. If the score is 10, it means that the prostate cancer has spread throughout, you know, from head to toe. His score was eight. And they did a CT scan looking for where the metastasis was, and it wasn't anywhere. It was still only in his prostate. So that's ketosis. It protects your other cells. And, he, and ketones can even kill cancer cells, too. That's been proven at University of South Florida. But anyways, he ended up passing away. Um, but And then amongst chiropractors, it's always been low carb. It's always been support of Weston A. Price Foundation. Mm -hmm. And there's a few chiropractors that have been uh, spreading the vegan sort of vegetarian low fat agenda. And I went to one of those seminars. And that, I think, was um, in the early 2000s, like 2001, 2002. And I remember chiropractors getting up and leaving and they're walking out of the, out of the building because, you know, low fat doesn't work. Just look mm -hmm. at everybody's been eating low fat since 1980 and the obesity rates have skyrocketed. So yeah, so uh, chiropractors have been really good with, uh, the clinical location and scientific relevance of the appropriate diet, specifically low carb and, and ketosis in my, in my 21 years. Yeah. You had, about with being vegan and I, I know I have vegan listeners and I'm not trying to offend any of my vegans, but you had about with being vegan. You were vegan for a while. What made you change your diet? Change it to veganism or away from veganism? Away, away from veganism. I, uh, so I was, I ate no meat for, I would say about a year. And the reason why I got away from it was because I graduated from chiropractic school and I moved from Illinois back to Ohio. Mm -hmm. And I lived with my sister and she threw a graduation party for me and she bought a whole bunch of bratwurst. I had no money and there was a lot of bratwurst. And during that summer I had, I worked three days a week on the fa family farm and three days a week 
in the office that I was renting space out of. So when I worked on the farm, I would go back home and have two brats for lunch and three for dinner. I did that for a couple months and I felt better. I got strength back. Mm-hmm. And that was, that was the end of my vegan experience. What, what made you go vegan in the first place? Was it just for health reasons? Was it ethical reasons or what was no, it? No, it was, it was, it's because one of my class, I think 25% of my class were vegetarian. Nobody, uh, nobody used the word vegan mm-hmm. in the mid nineties, right? That just didn't, that word was not a popular word at all. People said vegetarian. Mm-hmm. So I think 25% of my classmates were, tw- were vegetarian. And there's one guy in particular, he was eating a soy based textured vegetable protein hot dog. And he was just very content that it wasn't meat. He was very happy. It was very convenient. And I thought, well, okay, so I'm not going to eat meat. So because he's saying that TVP is better, the soy based hot dog is better. And, you know, you know, I was young. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was young. So anyways, that's what made me go vegan. Yeah, you had, you had a very interesting video. And this is something that I was telling people many years ago about how food affects our mood. And that was your meatless Monday video where you were talking about your experience in working with the public school system and the whole thing about why meatless Mondays are not really a good thing. So I wanted you to talk about that as an experience and why, again, you're to me, you're pro meat. And I meet a lot of people that are anti meat. And it seems like our whole society right now is anti meat. But you're more of what I call a pro meat person. But what did you experience in these meatless Mondays with this the public school system? In, in our, this was Michigan, correct? No, this actually this uh, was a grade school in Ohio. Okay. So I practiced for my first three years in Ohio. Okay. In the Toledo area, it was a school for um, unruly kids. Let's just put it that way. And they had two police officers on staff all the time. And I was walking around the hallway with the principal. And he said, it's very quiet right now. And I said, why is that? And he, he goes, I don't know. It's a good question, but I don't know. Then they brought in the lunches, which were shipped in from another part of town. And I'm, you know, so it was a corn dog and it was iceberg lettuce with, um, the salad dressing was like Italian or something. And it was, and then a fruit bowl. That's what I didn't mention in my videos, but I remember it now. And then the regular like milk and the kids went ballistic during lunch and the fight started and the crying and the running around and just, and then the cops who were bored in the morning were now babysitting and running around and sending kids off to the corner for timeout. It was a disaster. So about a half hour later, I was in the principal office and two kids came down and they couldn't eat the lunch because their stomachs hurt from the food. And he pulled out two big bars of candy and he said, we'll go to Wendy's. We'll get some food for you. And I just thought, man, there's no stopping this disaster called bad food in the, in the schools, in the school right here. But the point here is like, if they had just given those kids each four hot dogs, mm-hmm. you know, they would have been so much better because there's no corn, there's no wheat, there's no dairy, the allergies, the sugar from the fruit, the seed oils from the, from the salad dressing. And these are kids. So they're still developing. Your brain still develops up to the age of 25. You need to have fat to feed your brain and your nervous system all the way to age 25. If you want to be a vegan after that, that's your choice. But don't give your body such a horrible beginning by going low fat vegan and you're 19 years old or 23 years old. You're not even a, you know, you're barely an adult and your brain, your prefrontal cortex is not yet developed. So eat fat and eat meat and your body, your body needs that. You're developing and your body's still growing. So, that's my little tirade about that. The meatless Mondays is a big, it's a problem. There was a time when I first started my practice getting into nutrition, I belonged to the Rotary Club, in t- one of the Rotary Clubs in Toledo. Once a week we had our meetings. And one of the meetings they had a lunch that was, their summertime lunch. It was melon and fruit and they had no meat. And I just remember like, this is torture. You know, like, you're feeding all these people, like 50 people, no pre- no protein, no fat, just because it's summertime, you know? <laughs> so that was one of my lessons that I learned there. Why do you think that there's so much of a stigma attached attached to meat? Oh, oh, there's one. Well, there's two reasons. One is the emotion of 
related to killing an animal. Mm-hmm. That's huge. You know, he got uh, like a year old that watched the movie Bambi, and now they're going to go vegan. And now their hormones are starting to kick in, and it's like they need to eat meat. So you got there's got to be some emotional maturity around life and death. It's it's called the food chain. And you can argue against the food chain, but you're arguing against nature if you do that. The other thing is the the way that nutrition studies are designed, there's two main ways to look at, to, to run a nutrition study. One is called observational study, and the other one's called a trial, where you actually do something to a group of people. So this is, this is the bottom line for nutrition science is like 90% garbage. And here's why. So for 100 years, you do an observational study, look at two groups of people. One group is overweight, they're uh, sick, they smoke cigarettes, they drink alcohol, they don't wear their seatbelts, they don't go to their doctor, they don't exercise, and they eat meat. The other group is thin, they don't smoke, don't drink, they wear their seatbelt, they exercise, they see their doctor, they do everything their doctor tells them to do, which includes not eating meat, so they don't eat meat, they eat beans. So based on that, can you say that meat is bad? No. No, (laughs) because there's too many confounders. Mm -hmm. But time and time again, Harvard and the federal government, the USDA, the nutritionists, the dietitians, the medical doctors, the vegans, they all say meat is bad based on these observational studies. So what you do is you you get a hypothesis from the observational study. So let's say the hypothesis is meat is bad. So then... You send it up to other researchers that have more money, more manpower, and more integrity, and they do a trial. So there's a clinical trial and there's a randomized control trial. So here's one as an example. It's called the Women's Health Initiative. It's the most expensive nutrition study ever run by the federal government. It's like $700 million. And in one aspect of the study, they took two groups of women, and they said to one group, Reduce your meat intake by 20%. Keep everything else the same. And they tracked these two groups of women for years. And if meat was bad, you would expect that cancer, heart disease, all-cause mortality, and diabetes would all get reduced by 20% in the group that reduced their meat. Well, guess what? There was no change whatsoever. So that one study trumps all the other studies, all the other observational studies for the last 100 years. And this type of study has been done over and over, these randomized controlled trials or clinical trials. And so that's so meat is, does not cause heart disease, diabetes, or cancer. There's no proof of that. There's no trial that proves that. Yeah. Do you feel that there's some type of uh, smear, smear and fear campaign going on? Because you see a lot of documentaries yeah. now where – Forks over knives. I think uh, for the health of it is was another documentary. But you what see, the health? what the health? Yeah. So you see a lot of these things, and I've had people comment on my YouTube videos and things that I've done. And so I just I had a, just had a guy comment on YouTube video I did a while back. He said, "Oh, I saw forks over knives, and I became vegan." Do you think it is, there's a, like again that fear smear campaign going on where people are just scared yeah. away from meat? Yeah, it's it's that, but it's primarily the animal rights activists like PETA and other MDs and people who are attached to this idea that we can't kill any animals, they're the ones that lie. And like Kip Anderson's the guy that made What the Health, and he also made Cowspiracy. And there are critiques of these two movies, like What the Health is based, if you look at randomized control trials regarding the movie What the Health versus observational studies, that movie is 98% observational studies, which is garbage and 2% trial. So only 2% of that movie is based on scientific fact. And in 2015, the USDA put out a report on their dietary guidelines, and they cited 74 studies that were very positive towards low carb. And they studied, they cited zero studies that was positive for low fat, like vegetarian. Okay, so based on the science that they said in the report, you would think that they would be promoting the low-carb diet. But guess what? They're not. Why is that? Because it's a vegetarian vegan agenda. And that started in the, in the uh, religion of the Seventh-day Adventists in the 1800s. They had a prophetess 
who had this vision that said, oh, meat is bad. It causes people to fight and masturbate. So we're going to stop the consumption of meat. And she wrote some books about it. And then John Kellogg of, uh, you know, the serial Kellogg. Mm -hmm. I'm very familiar he, with it. He typeset her books. He was the one that, you know, put the typeset together and printed off her pages. And so he's reading her book as he's printing it off. So he took that idea and he ran with it. He created his sanitarium, which is only like an hour west of where I live. And I've, I've been to the Kellogg factory, you know, that kind of stuff. But it's, it's a, re, it's a, first a religious agenda. Secondly, a animal rights agenda. And then thirdly, I think there's really an anti-human agenda where there are some people who don't like humans and they want, they want us to suffer. And then this is a really tough conversation to have, but they lie to you. They just flat out lie. They don't believe what you say about real, real science. And, and, um, if they don't like you, they're going to make you sick. So what's the best way to make somebody sick is you take away their most nutritious food, which is red meat, especially for men. But women, I mean, you can't be afraid of eating red meat. It is the top superfood. It's better than kale and avocados and coconut oil and you name it. Red meat is the superior food. Mm -hmm. So you take that away and you give them soy and you give them white refined flour and sugar and vegetable oils. That's how you kill people. So you change your diet around and, and you make, and that's, that's an agenda right there. And I can name names, right? Ansel Keys, Mark Hegstead, you know, there's, there's and even people now in contemporary times, and on Twitter, they don't listen to the science. They, you can tell them over and over again, that is bad science, and they don't care. They're going to make you eat chia seeds and stay away from, you know, from beef and pork and lamb and stuff. Yeah, there was something that you had on one of your videos. I remember watching one of your lectures, and you were explaining the ratio of proteins and fats. And in that lecture, you were also talking about how we're more geared to being on statins by following a certain diet. But you said that in order for a person to avoid statins, all they have to do is adjust their diet. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's actually, uh, there's two things about that. So number one is the cholesterol goes up when you eat too many carbs. And the way that you normalize your cholesterol is by lowering the carbs and primarily getting into ketosis. So that means uh, the grams of carbohydrates might be below 20 grams a day, which means you're eating meat and very, and like small salads or, or something like that. And you want to measure that with various apps, food tracking apps. So that lowers your cholesterol and normalize it. And I've been doing that for, you know, 15 years. So not a big deal. About 20% of the population or maybe a little bit more are called lean mass hyper responders. So they lower their carb intake and their LDL stays up. They're Total cholesterol stays up. Their HDL is above 80, which is really good. And then their, L, their triglycerides go below 70, which is really good. So the point of that is that genetically, there are just some people that have high cholesterol. It does not mean that they're going to die from a heart attack. It does not mean they're at risk of heart disease. That's all genetic. Now, LDL is nothing more than a bus that carries fuel. LDL does not cause heart disease. So if your LDL goes up and you're, what's this thing called a lean mass hyper responder, that means that you have more energy and that you're burning more fat. So there's my answer to that question. Sound good? <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> okay. That's really good. Going back to just meat, this is what experience that I've had and Watching again, one of your lectures again, you talked about the basis of do we really need plants in our diet? And I remember interviewing a gentleman, this was a long time ago when I first started my podcast and he was talking about a dentist named William Kelly and William Kelly dealt with people with cancer and he noticed that some people did better with a vegan type diet when they had cancer, but he also noticed <laughs> that some people did extraordinarily well with meat in their diet. So it, uh, it always got me to, to thinking about this whole thing of why you know, a lot of people start going to vegan diets. They start juicing. They start doing all this stuff when they, when they get cancer. But what if they really needed meat? And you said one thing on your video about meat being that thing that can help or 
using meat to get in ketosis being that thing that could help people who might have cancer? Yeah, that's that's an interesting point that you bring up. So it was about two years ago when I figured out the relationship between veganism and ketosis and how they both can work. And that the single common denominator between the two of them is that they can help mitigate or reverse or stop the mechanism of chronic disease, which back in the 1930s, they called it lactic acidosis. And um, the definition of that has changed over the decades. But if we were to use that 1930s definition, lactic acidosis, it means you have dirty blood and your liver can't clean the dirt out, the garbage, the waste products. The cause of it is excess carbohydrate metabolism. In most cases, it could be black mold. It could be other causes. But veganism cleans the blood. And when you get into ketosis, it stops making the byproducts of carbohydrate metabolism. So, but in the bigger picture, I think that ketosis is better than veganism, be, you know, because you can have liver, which is super important to clean your blood. And, um, but either way, yeah, I can see some people do better with veganism for a short period of time. Other people do better with ketosis regarding cancer. Now, I personally have had 11 people accelerate their healing of cancer or get rid of cancer with just with ketosis. And I've had oncologists say to my patients, you're doing better than anybody I've ever seen in my whole career because they're on ket on the ketogenic diet. So, but yeah, that that's an interesting point. So Dr. Kelly, I, I have his book. Uh -huh. And he's a big he's a big proponent of enzymes. But you know those are those are different times back then. And Dr. Gerson talks about uh, juicing for cancer and for tuberculosis. You, if I can interrupt right. you there, what do you mean by different times? Is is that things are kind of gotten a lot worse when it comes to like things, what, yeah yeah okay yeah it's a lot worse. So but but there wasn't that much information known about ketosis when Kelly wrote his book and there's a lot of great information in the last 7 to 10 years on ketosis so if Dr Kelly was around now he would his book would be way different i'm sure and he would absolutely like in, endorse ketosis in his book so you are when i got when i looked at your video i got the impression that you were trying to prove that we don't really need plants. You couldn't find any studies where it says that we need to eat plants. Is that a fair assumption or am I totally off? No, that's right. That's from a researcher, Dr. Georgia Ede. She's a holistic psychiatrist and um, she's got a blog and she explains how she came to that conclusion. She went through PubMed and she's looking at what are the, what's the clinical trial or how many clinical trials are there that indicate that plants are good for us. And, um, she found like nine or something. This is meaning, and there's more. This hmm? is meaning vegetables and things of that. Yeah, nature. and fruit. Okay. Yeah, okay. vegetables and fruit. Yeah, tubers and stuff and leaves. And she found more studies that show that plants have no effect whatsoever. And also, too, Dr. Um, John Yonidis, he's the top meta researcher in the world. He picked 40 foods from a cookbook and he looked at all the research on these foods. So if you ever hear somebody say that if you eat five almonds a day, you'll live 12 years longer, that's an observational study. That's total BS. So Yonidis put together all these foods, and this is a technical point here, but when you look at these studies, these observational studies, you can do some math and get a score. If the score is one, it means it has no benefit and no detriment. If the score is above one, it means there might be a, a detriment. And if it's below one, it might be good for you. So when you put all these foods together, the score was 0.998. So these plants had no benefit or detriment to, um, in all, we're talking hundreds of studies. So we've been brought to believe, and I know a lot about studies because I was in pharma and I, I, I know how studies are, <laughs> how they yeah. kind of doctor studies to, to do everything. But, so if we're looking at this from another standpoint, all this stuff, because I had a cousin, he never ate any vegetables and we would always try yeah. to force and say, you have to eat vegetables. So if most of the stuff that we're looking at now and people are telling us are just observational things where people tell us, hey, eat this, eat this squash because it's good for you. Right. So is he healthy? Is he still alive, this guy? or what? Yeah, he's still You're alive. Healthy. He's still alive. Yeah. Okay. So the reason why people get cancer is primarily from the super processed foods that you get at the gas station or in the junk food aisle. Like people come to me and my business is called the Nutritional Healing Center. 
of Ann Arbor. So people know they're getting into nutrition when they see me. And I see some people who are really sick and they say, what's your diet been like? Well, I, I've been keto. Okay, how long have you been keto for? You know, they might say a month. What was your diet like before that? Oh, it was a disaster. You know, 30, 40, 60 years of cake and cookies and ice cream on a regular basis. So people that, you know, they know that it's the junk food that causes the cancer and the heart disease and the diabetes. Yeah. So with these people who are in ketosis or working for with a ketogenic diet, how long does it take for them to actually clear things up and for things to start looking a little bit better when it, when it comes to something like cancer? Oh, uh, well, but my rule about cancer is if ketosis is going to work for you, it's going to work within three months. I've had enough people where I can say that with, you know, pretty good clinical confidence. So get into ketosis and uh, keep getting your blood tested and the MRIs and CTs, whatever your MD is doing and how you feel. And if you're not any, if there's no change or you're worse after three months, well, no change is a good sign. But if you're worse after three months, then that's not right for you. An offshoot of that, we're talking about you don't need any plants. And I understand the carnivore diet is just a diet where you eat nothing but meat. And that's right. something that's something that you've been doing and that's something that I've been seeing a lot on my Instagram feed lately where people are going to this carnivore diet and for a lot of them some of them were keto first and then they started to go to this keto carnivore diet. I don't know if it's just an offshoot or what, but it's hard for me to wrap my head around just eating meat. How healthy is that for you when you when you're just eating meat? And is it a certain what? and well, I'll add to that question, is it a certain set of meat that you're eating or you you just eating beef or you just eating red meat can you eat chicken yeah you can have whatever meat that you want on the carnivore diet but a lot of people tend towards the red meat because it's more nutritious than white meat mm -hmm. so think of chicken as um, a bird that doesn't fly it's walking around a barn it doesn't flap its wings so the chest the breast bu uh, muscle isn't oxygenated with blood it's white mm -hmm. whereas ruminants are walking they're using all their muscles when they walk and they're Muscles get blood, so therefore it's red. So red meat is more nutritious. It has more iron in it and carnitine and other nutrients. Now, eating only meat is something that many people in our ancestry did, no matter what country uh, your ancestors are from. And so, and Weston A. Price talked about this in his book. He traveled the world in the 1930s, and he went to 134 indigenous tribes he said every tribe had meat of some sort, including fish, and every tribe had at least some sort of raw animal product, whether it was raw fish, raw fish eggs, raw milk, raw blood, raw muscle, uh, raw brain. So it's totally like in our evolution to eat nothing, to eat meat. Now, depending on, like for example, my ancestors are from Germany. So 10,000 years ago or, or 500 years ago, what did they eat from October to May? They had meat. They didn't grow. There was, there was no plants. There was snow. All the leaves were gone off the trees. The grass was covered in snow. So you hunt rabbits, you, you know, ice fish and you kill deer and that's how you get your food. There wasn't any plants to eat for most of the year. And then in the summertime, they come upon some berries and maybe get a beehive and get some honey. All right. But yeah, sugar was certainly not a huge part of their diet. And uh, for us now to eat, like I'm in Michigan and it's, it snowed this morning and there's no fruit, there's no vegetables. There's, you know, I could, I could pull out some roots. Maybe I can understand how people might eat, be eating some potatoes that were stored from, you know, from last fall. But traditionally right now in March in Michigan, there's no food, but animals. So there's my answer to that. Now I personally do eat plants still. I tried carnivore mm -hmm. and I, I certainly am doing so much better health wise in the last five months because I went from eating red meat twice a week to twice a day and I'm doing so much better. But in my past, I had problems with mold in uh, buildings. And one of the problems was con I got constipation from one of the locations. You mentioned and so, you had mentioned moving from, I think on your lecture, you had mentioned moving from your old building to the building that you were in because of, because of mold. Is that correct? Yeah, the old building, I was there for 13 years. Long story short, that mold settled in my heart. And I had horrible heart pain. So that's why I got this new building in June of last year. But the other location was a house I'd lived in for eight years. That mold settled in my intestines. So the mold will go where, wherever it wants to go. The mold in the, my office, not only was it in my heart, but it was also in my brain. Easily dizzy, um, brain didn't work so good. But the point of this is that when I eat too much meat or only meat, then I just get to constipation. But if I'd never had any trouble with mold, I don't think I'd have any trouble with meat. Now, one of the things, let me just, this is a, 
clinical thing that anybody can do if you want to experiment with more meat and you're afraid of constipation or getting fatigue from like what they call keto flu or maybe you get muscle cramping, there is a solution for it and it's actually very easy and inexpensive. You need more salt. So you get the Celtic sea salt or the Himalayan rock salt, the pink stuff. You do two teaspoons a day. That'll get your bowels moving. When you're eating meat, you drop your insulin down and it gets this whole cascade of hormonal effects in your body and you could lose some mineral. And there are native tribes that would eat 100 grams a day of salt every day because they're near the ocean. And if you do, if you do two, two teaspoons of salt per day, that's only eight and a half grams of salt. So most people are deficient in salt. Most people are deficient in protein. Most people are deficient in fats in their diet. Yeah. And then everybody's, everybody's toxic with carbohydrates. Yeah, I think there's a doctor that had a book on salt. James, I can't pronounce his last name, but um, he had a book on salt. And he was saying that you need, if you're, especially with protein, you need to have additional salt. One of the things that I noticed, um, Dr. Darren, is I'll eat a pound of meat. And I got this from Ray Audet. Ray Audet is the first guy who wrote a book about paleo. Are you familiar yeah. with him? And, yeah. And he's, he had this video where he would eat a pound of bacon. And I started doing that. I'll, I'll eat a, like, uh, last night I had a pound of lamb and I had a uh, half of a sweet potato, just very low carb, small sweet potato, very low carb. And that works wonders for my body. And I can eat that and I don't want to eat more stuff. And I also fast. So that's, and I've been doing that for years and it just seems to work wonders for my body. And lamb is, one of those meats that just works with my body. But when I tell people I eat a pound of lamb, they can't wrap their head around that. But the carnivore diet, from what I see from you, is you have people out here who are eating a pound or more of meat and not having any issues. Right. Yeah. Um, so I said you got to kind of position it a little s s like this. Um, there are people who can eat, let's say they're going to eat two pounds of meat in one sitting. And then when's the next time they're going to eat? They may not eat for 30 hours. So that's part of the deal. You can't eat five meals a day when you eat a pound of meat. You know, you got to wait 10 hours or something and just eat the next time you eat is when you're hungry. And it changes everything. It, it changes your whole viewpoint on food and then your body responds so greatly to it. Yeah, it's been fantastic. My results eating more carnivore has been fantastic. You said something about fasting too, and I wanted to get into that. I fast, I've been doing intermittent fasting for a number of years because I've always noticed that I wasn't a breakfast person. And I always noticed that when I would eat breakfast, I would have this, I would want to just eat all all day. I would just eat one meal, then I would eat another yeah. meal, then I would snack and snack. And it kind of helped me to start controlling food. But what is your opinion of fasting and what's the best type of fasting for people out? Well, the easiest, I'm going to start by saying this, the easiest way to approach fasting is to eat meat and healthy fat and pr and protein, especially red meat protein. And then you eat a large quantity of it and you might be surprised at how much you can eat. And then you just wait to see when you're hungry again. And I've done this. I had a big ribeye steak one day. This is in the summertime. I didn't, I didn't eat for another 22 hours. So that's the easiest way to fast is just stuff your face with the most nutritious food on the planet. And so I'm also a big fan of longer term fasting and I have patience. You know, when I, when I talk like this, I'm also talking about full-time clinical hardcore nutrition practice. So it's not just about me and my experience, but mm -hmm. my patients too. So I have patients, they go five days with no food, only water. And one guy did 10 days and he also did a dry fast, which means no water at all for 40 hours in the middle of that 10 days. And I have a guy now eating one meal, one meal per week and he's losing a ton of weight. And so all this has to be monitored well and looking for results. And it really comes down to what is your goal and what can you handle? So I personally have not fasted more than 24 hours. And I'm thin. I've always been thin. I'm going to be the first person to die in a famine. So I have not done a five-day fast, but I know I need to do it because of the first several reasons, but the black mold is one of them. So anyways, that's the kind of like the gist of it. You can start off by doing the intermittent fast where you just break, where you just avoid breakfast and then experiment with a 24-hour fast, but you got to prepare yourself by eating some good quality fat and protein and preparation for that. And then if you're going to do a five day or a longer term fast, you might as well shoot for a five day fast. And here's why. So with the first day, you're, you might do okay. The second day you get really hungry and irritable. And then the third day you get into ketosis. Now you feel good. Then on the fourth day, you get 
autophagy, which is stems, which is cell death. And then on the fifth day, you get a surge of new stem cells to replace the cells that have died. And that's the, that's the sequence of events in a five day fast. So that's a really good target for people to reach for. And you don't, you know, you could go for longer if you want to, but man, a five day fast is so therapeutic and you can do it once a year. You can do it more if you want, but like once a year is a good target to reach for. With um, the fasting, do you find that people, I had this issue, but I don't have it anymore. <laughs> I used to get kind of constipated where I would not be able to use the bathroom and I found that I wasn't drinking enough water and that happened to me. But do you find that you might have some people out there who are drinking enough water, but when they're fasting, they just simply have issues with constipation? Well, that could be from the lack of salt too. So mm -hmm. like at what point, if you're, if your constipation starts on day two and a half, then or three, then that's the keto. That's when you got into ketosis. Yeah. So immediately, immediately in ketosis, your body dumps a bunch of water. I've had people urinate extra for like three days in a row, and their blood pressure drops. That's because of ketosis, and they lower their insulin. They lose a bunch of excess fluid. But when you lose that extra fluid, you might also lose the calcium, magnesium, and potassium. Mm -hmm. That's where the salt comes in, and you, you replenish those minerals. Yeah, I have to be really, I have to really pay attention to how much water I'm drinking and, and kind of monitor that because I don't know for me when I get up in the morning, I have to drink water and then everything starts moving. And uh, I, I wasn't doing that in the past, and I just really have to make sure I, I do that. Something I wanted to ask you as well is about the keto flu because does keto work for everyone? Because I know some people will say, hey, well, uh, I just started feeling bad on keto, which I'm going to assume that they started having that keto flu. And to me, there seems to be a point where you get over that hump, but most people don't let themselves get over that yeah. keto flu hump. But you also have people say, well, it just didn't work for me. Is keto one of those diets where it just, it works for people 80% of the time, but 20% of the time it won't work? Or is it because they get to that keto flu and they say, okay, this doesn't work for me. And then they go back to right. eating the, the way that they ate. Right. Yeah. You bring up some very good points in that. So, uh, and, and to order, in order to answer this, I'm going to share with my experience. Mm -hmm. Three years ago, I had the black mold poisoning. And it settled in my heart and my lungs. And when I got, at the time I was first learning true keto, I dropped my carbs down and my heart hurt more. So if you have black mold or candida or something in your body like that, the mold or fungus can grow by consuming the ketones. So that might make you worse. So that's a little clinical pearl. But what you're saying, and so like I did keto one day a month for six, six months. Then I got it up to two days a month. Now I'm in ketosis almost every day, like nine days out of 10, for example. And this is three years later, right? So give yourself years to get there. Now, if you get into ketosis and now you're tired, that's keto flu, you need to eat salt. And the other aspect of this though, too, is that when you first get into ketosis, your body could be making ketones, but not using them. And at the same time, your blood sugar is dropping. So your cells don't have any fuel. They're not used to doing ketones yet and they're losing sugar. And so you get tired. Well, come out of ketosis, eat carbs, get back in ketosis, cycle in and out, in and out. Month after month after month, you're going to get better and better and you'll get results year after year. You'll keep getting improvements. So if you try the keto diet for a week and it didn't work for you, you didn't do it. <laughs> You're, you, you gotta try, you gotta go for at least a year. And even if it doesn't work after a year, you gotta fix the mold, you gotta detoxify, you gotta do whatever it takes to get your body to a state where it can handle ketosis because ketosis is the native state of the body. So if you can't get to the native state of the body, that's actually a poor position to be in. Yeah, I think what happens with a lot of people and this is something I learned through business the hard way is that sometimes these diets, people look on the Internet and they're looking at things on YouTube and they start them and then they get to a point and then they're like, OK, well, I'm experiencing this, these symptoms and they don't have a coach, someone they can look to to say, hey, this is what I'm going through. And I think sometimes you need a coach on a diet like this. And more, more than likely, a lot of people aren't willing to go to a coach and say, hey, can you coach me through this? And I've had several people on talking about the ketogenic diet. And the thing that sticks in my head is that, again, you need that person who might be able to coach you through this and provide the things that you need, because sometimes it's just a point where you're going to get, you're going to hit that wall 
And that wall could be the difference between success or backsliding back into eating, doing your old eating habits and experiencing, uh, not experiencing success, so to speak. Right. Yeah, exactly. Coaches are important for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You also mentioned something again. I think you said this early in the thing, but I wanted to get back to it. You mentioned in one of your videos that meat is uh, hypoallergenic. Explain that statement. Hypo. Hypo. Yeah. So uh, meat is hypoallergenic and w compared to plants. So plants are st stuck in the dirt. They can't run away. They create chemicals to punish you for eating them. Or for even touching them, mm -hmm. like poison ivy. So that's their defense. It's called secondary metabolites. And the, the the primary metabolites are like the fiber, the cellulose, the wood, you know, like what they're made out of. The secondary metabolites are the defense and the immune system of the plant. Now, animals will kick you, bite you, claw, run away. So their, their meat is hypoallergenic. Now, one thing, though, too, about the plants and their secondary metabolites is that not... They could, they could be very harmful to you, but they also, other secondary metabolites could be very beneficial to you. So you look at echinacea and you look at their herbs, turmeric, for example, those secondary metabolites can increase circulation, help your immune system get stronger and smarter and do all these wonderful things. So again, it comes down to what your body can handle. And there are people who are allergic, allergic to echinacea or, you know, they can't take whatever, you know, herb. So, so plants, they can be tricky sometimes, but again, just determine for yourself what works for you. You are a big proponent of glandular products. I've heard, I saw some of your videos and you were preaching the gospel on glandular products. Why is that? Because it mimics our ancestors diet because they would eat glands sometimes. And also too, when you eat glands, you're feeding your own glands. And I think those are my two reasons. But it's you, part of nature. Yeah, it's part of nature. But you tried a lot of stuff that I think I, I'm not brave enough to try. You had what, bull testicles? Uh, what's the, what's another weird one that you, you've tried? In the form of a of a supplement, yeah, yeah, uh, skin, brain, liver, eyes, uh, spleen, pretty much every organ of the animal I've had in supplement form. Mm -hmm. And I saw I, I made a product called Heritage Glandulars. It's now on Amazon. It's nine organs in one pill. I mean, we're, you know. Go ahead. I was just saying I'm familiar with that because I there was a product when I, I used to go to my practitioner and she would put me on for my adrenals and it was made from from cows and it always seemed to work really well for me. And then the company that made it stopped making it. So I know, the you know, pretty much know the power of glandular products. So I'm, yeah. I'm with you on that. Yeah, cool. All right. So last question. These are good. These are, these are great questions, Darren. Uh, they're <laughs> fantastic. You. Yeah, you're welcome. Oh, I wanted to ask you about this, too. I got two more questions for you. And and then we'll, we'll get you off of here. Um, one, th one thing that, uh, again, that stuck out to me when you were doing your lectures that you're not a proponent of raw milk. And I've talked to so many people who say, if you're going to drink milk, I'm not a milk drinker. I cut it out my diet a long time ago. But you're not a proponent of raw milk. Tell us why that's so. Well, I had a patient who almost died from Q fever. And Q fever comes from raw milk. Now, I know that there are families who feed their kids raw milk and the kids thrive and they grow strong and their brain works good and it actually reverses cavities and there's all these wonderful properties for the immune system and I get it. But if you have a bad farmer with a dirty barn mm -hmm. and unsanitary milk jugs, you could die. So I don't recommend to my patients, I don't walk around and tell people to go find a raw milk farmer and drink raw milk. That's my answer to that. And, and you can go on. Everybody talks, about, everybody else talks about it. So mm -hmm. I let everybody else talk about it, but I'm not the guy that does that. Yeah. My last question for you is very bizarre, <laughs> but you had a video and I think you took the video down, but you referenced another video where you were drinking blood. Right. Um, I know you're not a vampire. But no. explain your reasons behind drinking blood and why you were doing that. Because it's a food. Blood <laughs> is a food. And, West, and you know, when you look at different cultures like Japan, their raw food was fish. I mean, you get sushi now. In, in Europe, uh, the raw food was dairy. In the Native Americans, they ate raw heart. Eskimo eat raw adrenals and raw fat and raw everything. Uh, Africans, uh, raw blood. So they would take an arrow and they would shoot it right into the neck of a cow, just a small hole, and they would capture that in a vessel and they would just drink it. And um, 
So I put that, I drank, uh, so here's the thing about this. My meat comes from a farmer 12 miles west of my house. And for six years, I cut open this package and, you know, pull the steak out and all this blood comes out and I pour it down the sink. So technically it's not blood, according to several people, it's myoglobin. So the cow is butchered and the blood is drained out. What's remaining inside the muscle meat is myoglobin. And so I had the myoglobin on the plate and I, I watch people on YouTube, they're eating raw glands and raw meat and stuff. And, and I, I've always, and so when I was a kid, I used, you know, if you cut your finger, you suck on the wound, mm -hmm. you know, you're sucking on your own blood. But so I drank, I put, I picked a plate up and I drank it and I filmed it and I put it on my YouTube channel. And a lot of people appreciated it, but there were several people who didn't. And they quoted the Bible saying that in the Bible, you know, you don't want to drink the life giving blood. And I'm thinking, well, why not? Like it's, you said it's life giving. Like of all the things in the, in the animal, what gives more life than the blood? And how is it dirty? Like if the blood is going to the organs to feed the organs, you know, like it's life giving. So anyways, I drank it in about three seconds after I consumed it, it hit my brain. And it was, it was like, bing, like my brain turned on. It was great. And so, but it turned off a lot of people and I took the video down and I'll probably never do it again. But there's other people on YouTube that they're eating raw meat, they're eating raw parts, glands, drinking raw blood. So I don't, I don't have to be that guy. But, and it's not something I'm going to do. It's just something I wanted to try. I'm not going to make a habit out of it. Will I do it again in the future? Maybe. But it's not like the, you know, I'm not like the guy that drinks blood. I'm the guy, I'm the guy that experiments with foods and I'm trying to get other people well. So, you know, there's my answer to that. Yeah, what do you think you, of that? You made a valid point that it's food. And a lot of times I think we have these things around food where we are, we don't like liver. We just like muscle meats. And when you look at our ancestors, they ate everything from liver, all the, all the, organs and now we've come to the society where that's nasty and it looks like we need to go back to eating these types of foods to get more healthy like we've gotten away from that so I yeah can, uh, and, go ahead i'm sorry yeah, yeah the blood when i tasted it it was very minerally mm -hmm. and very refreshing and very light and i may be you know turning some people off right now but it was it, and if you ever ever had a rare rare steak it wasn't too far from that as far as taste yeah so, it's, a, it's the same thing yeah. well Dr. Darren, it has been wonderful talking to you. Your um, clinic is, uh, I believe you mentioned it before, but please mention it again. Yeah, it, our website is the nutritionalhealingcenter.com. So we have uh, five other, or five of us practitioners who focus on nutrition. We do long distance consulting too. We see people locally. We have people fly in from all over the world that come to see us for uh, like what we call the travel package, which is three uh -huh. visits in two days. And then we put together a good program for them in those three visits. But the nutritionalhealingcenter.com is how, is the best way to get a hold of us. And then my favorite social media platform is the YouTube channel. So you can go on YouTube and search my name and maybe put in the word ketosis or something to yeah. find me that way. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I found you. Um, and I just want to say guys, you a lot of good videos. So if you want to learn more, I think a lot of times we glance over podcasts or listen to podcasts and really don't dig deeper. Your videos were really, uh, really good because they dug deeper and you gave a lot of really good explanations with regards to why you think this way, why this, this happens as well as tonight, just talk Talking to you, you can tell that you're more, you get into it. <laughs> you really yeah. let people know what, why they should do this and why they should maybe stay away from certain things. So videos are really good. But I thank you for yeah. being on, uh, being on tonight. We really had a good discussion. With you. Yeah, you're welcome, Darren. Thanks for asking me. This is a, you had some really good questions. I enjoyed it. <laughs>